Welcome everybody to the house of God. <laughs> today we're talking about uh, the topic for today is when God seems distant, when God seems far away, when it seems like God is no longer on your case, when it seems like God is no longer in your matter, when it seems like God is, you know, you're praying but there's no answer. Psalm 71 verse 12, it says, do not be far from me, my God, come quickly, God, to help me. So God has clearly promised in, us, in his word that he will never leave us or forsake us. Because Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. This was God talking to the Israelites. He said, For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. This is God's promise for them. And that same promise extends to us. And also Matthew 28 verse 20 says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He did not say till, you, till you're 30. He did not say till you have children. He did not say till a certain point, but rather he says till the very end of age. And we know that our God who promised is faithful to do as he has promised. For 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says, The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. The one who has called you and I is faithful and he will do it. But as we all know, there are moments in our lives where we feel like we've been abandoned by God. Where we feel like he's no longer listening to us. Where, you know, it becomes very hard to pray. It becomes very hard to engage in the things of God. And as most of us will admit, this is very heart-wrenching. You feel like the whole world is against you. You feel like nobody likes you. You feel, uh, even to the point where some people even feel like committing suicide. Because at that point, like, they feel like nothing is working for them. But I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Even King David in Psalm 22 verse 1 to 2 said, My God, This is someone that was called a friend of God. This was someone that was called a friend. He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, I am not silent. But as we know, the Bible says the, that the hears of that God is not deaf, that he cannot hear us. That his arms are not sure that he cannot save us. God is always listening. But here David felt like God was not with him. Some people look around them and they feel alone. Yes, we, we say we are Christians. We say we believe in God. You know, we try as much to walk in line of God. You know, you look into your life, there's no sin. But for some reason, you just feel lonely. For some reason, you feel like nothing is working for you. God seems so distant. You become very, to even say amen is very hard. You know, to meditate, to study God's word becomes very hard. It becomes a task. It becomes something that weighs on you. And even gathering together with, you know, fellow believers seems very hard. But I'll tell you this morning, God is on the matter. God is not dead, but he's alive. If this sounds like what you're going through, be rest assured that you are not alone. What you're going through is not abnormal and it is nothing new. Even the Bible says there's a time for everything under the sun. There's a time. There's a time for mourning. There's a time for rejoicing. There's a time for weeping. There's a time for laughing. There's a time for everything. Even our forefathers, the patriarchs of old, they went through a time of drought. They went through a time, the time where they felt like God was not with them. But the world, what kept them through the word of God, the, promise of, the promises of God. So I wrote say even our forefathers went through these motions. And many with us right now. I go, I've, I've, I've went through, I've gone through it. Where I tell my husband, like, you know what? I don't even feel like doing anything. I don't feel like praying. Because prayer itself feels hard. You just feel like you're just muttering, just, you know, you feel like you're wasting your time. But we have an example, Job. Did Job give up? Everything was taken from Job. Everything and anything and everything. that Even if we lose 1% of what Job lost, more, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people are ready to commit suicide. But Job held on to God. So this teaching is for anyone who at one point is asking themselves, has God left me? And when we say everyone, we mean Christians, we mean believers. People that you expect that God will be with all the time. Because at one point in our life, we have felt the distance of God. Considering the patriarchs of all the apostles before us, they all at one point felt emptiness. So, be not, so do not be discouraged for God knows how you feel. Because he too once felt it. Yes, Jesus felt loneliness at one time. For the Bible tells us in Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest 
this is Jesus Christ, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. But the Bible says, yet he did not sin. Yet he did not forsake God. Yes, he did not turn back. So this is a call for us to cry out to him to help us. For he understands how hard that feeling. You understand what we're going through. So right now we'll look into examples of people in the Bible that felt that God had left them at one point in time. The first example here is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The one who knew no sin was without sin, but yet he gave himself up as a living sacrifice. He died for us. Jesus himself, who is the son of God, cried out to God at one point. This was when he was nailed to the cross. He had been nailed. It was almost to the point of He said, Father, why have you forsaken him? More appropriately, the Bible in Matthew 27, 46 says, About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, He lie, he lie, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus Christ is God. Even at this point in time, he felt forsaken. He felt aban abandoned. Because at this time, it seems like God was so far off from him. But can we say that God had left him? No. Why? Because on the... Yes, Jesus Christ died. He was buried. But on the third day, the Father, God the Father rose him up from the dead. And did not, he did not leave him alone in the grave. Psalm 16 verse 10 says, Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful seed decay. Another example is Joseph. Joseph. The son, of Jacob, uh, the son of Jacob, the son of Israel. Joseph was a man who would rather go to jail than sleep with his boss's wife. He would rather go to jail than sin against God. Jacob, uh, Joseph had every reason to be bitter. His own brothers sold him to slavery. He had every reason to be bitter because that's what some people do. When people hurt them, they feel like they have to hurt people back. When people hurt them, they feel like they have to retaliate. They feel like they have no reason to live, you know, to live a good life anymore. They just want to live their life in a mess. But J Joseph, rather than sin against God, rather than offend his own master, he chose to go to jail. The book of Genesis 39 verse 9 says, No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except he was talking to the wife of Potiphar. Because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? At another point, even while he was in jail, it was opportune to interpret uh, uh, you know, the dreams of uh, the cup bearer and the baker. And the cup bearer promised him that once he gets out, he will help him out. But the Bible told us that for two years, Joseph was forgotten. This was another excuse, another reason for him to be bitter and to say, you know what? This is all, you know, all this doing good is of no use because it brought him nothing good. But what did Joseph do? He held on to God. The Bible says in Genesis 14, 23, it says the, cup, the chief cup bearer, however, did not remember Joseph, but he forgot him. But in due time, because we serve a God that fulfills promises. It made, it caused Pharaoh to, uh, to have a dream that no one could interpret. It was then that the cup bearer said, oh, I'm sorry. There was a man that, in, I had a dream. There was a man that interpreted it for me. This is a man I know will be able to. And what happened? Joseph was brought out. Joseph overnight went from uh, what you, a jailer, someone that was in jail, to a prime minister overnight. Joseph did not give up. Joseph did not give up. So who are we to give up? What have we gone through? Have we been thrown in jail? Have we been, have we been taken, have, have we been turned slaves? Have we been sold by our brothers? I pray that God will help us this morning in Jesus' name. Another example is Elijah. Elijah the prophet. The Bible in James 5, 17 says, Elijah was a human being even as we are. Elijah was someone like you and I, someone of like passion. There was nothing that differentiated Elijah from us. Elijah was no better than us and he was no less than us. Elijah was like us. But Elijah gave himself to God. He gave himself up to God to be used by God. Elijah was a man that called down fire. He was a man that prayed. And indeed the heavens held back rain. That there was no rain on the land for three and a half years. And there was famine. Elijah was a man 
you know, it will have after another, you know, he prayed again and it began to rain and everything was restored. <laughs> a man that just called down fire to consume, you know, the altar and everything that they said they should kill the prophet. What happened? Ahab went to Jezebel, his wife, and told him what Elijah did. That Elijah had killed all the prophets of Baal. <laughs> Jezebel now said, okay, you know, this man, the same faith, he too will suffer it. What did Elijah do? He ran away. A man that just called down fire, that knew the power of God that was in him. He called down fire. So at one point, he sat down under a tree and he felt distant from God. He considered himself no better than anyone before him. The Bible tells us in 1 Kings 19 verse 4, While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush or tree. He sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors because of a, a threat from a woman a threat from a woman the same person that called down fire from heaven can't he call down fire to destroy Jezebel but rather at this point in time he felt that like God had left him may God help us in Jesus name one of the greatest example was Job Job too once felt that God was not with him the Bible recorded Job as a righteous man as a righteous man that even God gave this record on his behalf. But yet Job felt abandoned. What was the story of Job? The Bible told us that the angels, the sons of men, were gathered before God. And even the devil came and presented himself. And God asked, asked the devil, where have you been? He said, there has been going to and fro the hurt. And what did God now say? Have you seen my servant Job? Have you seen my servant Job? You know, there's none like him. And what did the devil say? Is it not because you have put an hedge around him? Is it not because you have given him prosperity? Is it not because you have blessed him? Is it not because? And because of that, God said, okay, you want to you wanna see that my servant, regardless of what I blessed him, is faithful? Go ahead. And everything Job had was destroyed. Everything. His seven sons, his three daughters, his animals, everything he had was destroyed. But yet, what did he say? Even though he slays me, I will yet praise him. God forbid, but have you lost a child? Have you had everything taken from you in one moment? This was not something that happened day to day. This was something that happened within the same time frame. As one servant was coming to say, oh, the cattle, the oxen, everything was destroyed. You know, they've been taken away, blah, blah, blah. Another was coming to say, oh, the fire fell from blah, blah, blah. Another one came and said, oh, the wind came, fell on the house and destroyed your children as they were rejoicing. And it's, even though he slays me, I will still praise him. Even his wife said in Job 2 9, Are you still maintaining your integrity? What is this integrity? Why are you trying to act as if, why are you acting earlier than thou? Who do you think you are? Just curse God and die. That was what his wife said. But Job said, You foolish woman, shall we accept only good from God? Basically, his wife was telling him that. If God cannot show up for you now, then what, what do you need him for? There is no need putting up with him. Even in Job 30 verse 2, 20, I mean 30 verse 20, Job said, I cry out to you, God, but you do not answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. But as we read further into the chapter, into Job, we see that God, Job did not give up. Even his own friends, his three friends, they said it's because you have sinned. You must have done something. God is a good God. He will not just bring this affliction on you. For nothing. Even they, they told him, you have seen, you must have done something wrong. But God in his faithfulness, God in his mercy, God, you know, because he's God, according to his character, he showed up. And he blessed Job even more than his beginning. He blessed him with seven sons again and three daughters. His oxen, the animals he had were doubled. Job showed that nothing was more important to him than God. It was not about the money. It was not about the wealth. It was not about the prestige. It was not about the children. Can we say that of ourselves this morning? If all these things were taken from us, what we would do? A lot of us would just say, you know, God, enough is enough. Oh, people, some people associate God with only good things. But like Job said, Job said can, do we expect only good things from God and not bad? Though God is not a wicked God. He will not afflict, you know, he will not bring affliction into our lives. May God help us in Jesus' name. So there are many reasons why God may seem distant. So there are many factors that could make an individual think God is distant or in actual fact God is silent. 
This is where we need honesty. This is where we need sincerity. This is where we need to examine ourselves. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you know yourself? Do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. So when you feel like God is silent, when you feel like God is distant, one of the first things you need to ask yourself, is there any way I've fallen short of his glory? You need to examine yourself. Look at yourself. Is there any way? Because God is God. Like, you know, my husband uses an analogy. God is like a signpost. It's either you are driving towards the post or you are driving away from the post. The closer you are to the post, the closer it is to you. But the farther away you go from it, the farther away it is to you. But the post remains where he is. God is God. God remains who he is. God is never changing. So have you moved away from God? Many assume that the feeling of God being distant only comes from sin. Yes, sin is number one, but it is not always, it is not only sin. Yes, sin separates men from God and makes God silent to one. The book of Isaiah 59 verse 1 to 2 says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is yes too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sin have eaten its face from you, so that it will not hear. It is not that it cannot hear, it is not that it is deaf. But it is your sin that has caused the barrier. If you put a piece of cloth over your eyes, it is not because you are blind, but because you have used something to blind yourself, that's why you cannot see. So in this case, it is not because God cannot hear you, but God, can, God cannot behold iniquity. He cannot behold it. It is against his nature. Our God is a holy God and cannot behold sin no matter who we think we are. Sin for sure will cause God and his Holy Spirit to be far from us. So for everyone who is feeling alone without God, we need to ask ourselves this question. Am I with sin? Have I sinned against God? And if sin is present, we need to humble ourselves, repent, and ask God for restoration. We all know the story of David. In the time that kings went to war, what did he do? He stayed at home. And he could not sleep, so he went to the top, the roof of the house. He was walking about, and that was when he beheld sin. He saw Bathsheba taking a bath. If you see something, and you as the child of God, close your eyes, go away from the brother, he stayed there, and he began to relish what he was seeing. He was seeing it, he was thinking it, and he, he thought he actually, he actually put it into action. He now said, he should go and call the woman from him, and he slept with her, and they had a child. The child died. And it, it did not feel like he had done anything wrong until God sent the prophet Nathan to him. Th that one gave him a parable of a man. And, you know, that what would you do? J uh, David was like, this is what I would do. Nathan said, you are that man. And what did he do? He repented. He rented his clothes. He repented. Do we have that same heart? Do we have that same spirit? I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Sin for sure will cause God and his Holy Spirit to be far from us. So for everyone who is feeling alone without God, we need to ask ourselves, I already said this already, for the book of 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17 says, Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. Psalm 51 verse 11 says, Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all our righteousness. I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Another way, another situation that can make God seem like he's silent or distant is during the test of love. This is where we bring again the story of Job. God knew what Job would do, but Job did not know what he would do if he was, you know, if he was in that situation. And that had to happen for Job himself to know. To know that indeed he was for God. Do you, God knew that Job was for him. That Job would not curse God. That Job would not give up on God. Sometimes this is why we go through some tests. The Bible says God does not tempt. God does not, God does not tempt us to do evil. It is not God's nature. But yes, it might test us. It is not for God, but it is rather for us. Because a lot of us will profess that we love God. But when we're met with the situation, we start changing our language. We start changing. We start running out of skelter where there is no solution. When sin is not present and we feel a sense of God's absence, it could mean that one is go going through a phase of test of love, or, um, a test of faith or love for God. In the case of Job, the devil told God 
that Job only loved God because of the prosperity, because of God's protection over his life. And that if all was taken away, that, God will, that Job will curse God. So the question is, will you still love God if that promotion does not come? Will you still love God if you lose that job you so much depend on today? Will you continue to love God? God forbid something happens to the children. Will you still love God? Will you continue to love God even if your prayers are not answered? Will you continue to love God even if it seems that you are left alone on the cross with troubles coming at you on all sides? But our response should be like Paul who said in 2 Corinthians 4.8 We are hard pressed on all sides but we are not crushed. We are perplexed but not in despair. We are persecuted but not abandoned. We are struck down but not destroyed. I pray that during the test of our love for God, we will not fail in Jesus' name. God himself will uphold us in the mighty name of Jesus. Another thing that may make us think that God is distant is our emotions. The book of John 20 verse 29 says, Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. A lot of people, they need to see before they can believe. But the Bible is telling us that blessed are those that be, that have not seen but yes be, believed many people have built their faith and trust in god based on emotions you know they go to a church if there's no music then god must not be there just like we know of the story about elijah when god told him you know the raven god made the raven to feed him god god, god told him to go to the mountain he went to the mount of horeb right you know god was like what, what are you doing here there was a, there was a wind but what did the bible say god was not in the wind there was an earthquake god was not in the earthquake but there was a still, small voice. It's not all about how we feel. You know, some people go to church, they build their faith and trust in God based on emotion. They say, oh, I feel God because the music group at the church were perfect. The drums and the instruments, everything were synchronized perfectly. But when I'm in a place where there's no music, where things are not synchronized, then perhaps I don't feel God because God is not there. But in actual fact, God is not in the synchronized music. God is not in the particular preacher. Many will also believe if they see. But God desires that those who will worship him and trust him without sin. The book of John 4.24 says, God is a spirit and they that must worship him must worship him in truth and in spirit. It did not say with your emotions, with how you feel. Christians are not to depend on their five senses. You're not to depend on how you feel, what you can see, what you can hear, what you can smell, what you can taste. For we will not always have the desire. I'm telling the desire to pray does not come naturally. It's by the grace, it's by the help of God that one is able to pray. And this does not mean that God does not want us to pray. Because you don't feel like praying does not mean that God does not want you to pray. The Bible says in the book of 2 Timothy 4 verse 2 says, Preach the word of God. As an official messenger, be ready. That means be prepared. When the time is right, and even when it is not, that is keep your sense of urgency. Whether the opportunity seems favorable or unfavorable, whether convenient or inconvenient, whether welcome or, or, or unwelcome. Our flesh will not always want God, and this does not mean that God does not want us. For even as it is said in book of Matthew 26 verse 41b, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Emotion is the flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We see in the book of 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 11 to 13, many people are like Elijah who look for God in the dramatics. I just said this. He looked for God in the fire. He looked for God in the earthquake. He looked for God in the places that God was not. But he failed to understand that God showed him, God shows, always shows himself in the small and the things that seem insignificant. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 27 says, God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God is not always reflected in your strength. It's not always just reflected in your wisdom. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. In another area, another time where we might feel like God is distant in our time of trouble. In our time of trouble. In our time of need. Many have this misconception of God's presence in the body of Christ today. 
Many assume that if everything is going well, then God is present. Many assume that if there's 10,000 of people in the church, then God is present. Many assume that if there's healing in the church, God is present. But God said on that day, when they, you know, they will say, but Lord, Lord, I healed in your name. Lord, Lord, I did this in your name. But say, I know you not. You walk out of iniquity. You know, many assume that when everything is going well, then God is there. Then God, then they now assume that when there's a trouble, when there's challenge in one's life, then God is absent. Just like in the case of Job and his friends. His friends thought perhaps the calamity had come upon him because he had sinned. Because, the, because of what he was going through, then that means God is no longer with him. This same attitude, like I said, was in the friends of Job. That when they assume that Job's sin is what brought him troubles. Job chapter 4 verse 8 says, As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. That means you must have deserved it. You must have done something for trouble to come upon your life. But we need to understand that Jesus did not tell us we will have a trouble-free life. Rather, we will have challenges. Just like Paul said, we're persecuted but not abandoned. We're struck down but not in despair. They went through things. They went through troubles because of their faith. John 16 verse 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. This is the word of God. In this world, you will have trouble. You will have trouble. It is synonymous with being a Christian. I have a story here. Most of us are very familiar with the story of the poem. It's called Footprints in the Sand. Footprints in the Sand. In the Sand. This is an example of where people assume that when you're in trouble, God is not with you. I pray that God... Thank you, sir. If the Footprints in the Sand. It says, last night I had a dream. I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonged to me and one belonged to the Lord. After the last scene of, the, of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprint in the sand. I noticed that many times along the path of my life, especially at the lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This person said, this really troubled me. So I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said, once I decided to follow you, you would walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you the most, you would leave me. This person assumed that God was not with him when he was in trouble. But the Lord replied, my son, my precious child, I love you and I would never leave you. During your times of suffering, when you could see only one set of footprints, it was then I carried you. That single set of footprints was not his own footprint, but rather it was God's. That was when God was carrying him. But he felt like God had abandoned him, that he was alone. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Another time, another reason why we might feel like God is not with us is about timing. Timing. Saul failed when he had the feeling that God was not present. Because the timing at which he thought God would appear seemed to be delayed. The prophet Samuel did not show up when he, thought, when he said he would show up. And what did Saul do? He went ahead and did what he was not supposed to do. And this became a slippery, a slippery slope to his downfall. This was when he lost the kingdom. So we need to be very careful about putting God in the box. Even though the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our, you know, are higher than our thoughts. Our God is a mysterious God. We cannot go know God in all totality. We should never box God. Just because God speaks to you in an earthquake today does not mean he will speak to you in an earthquake tomorrow. Just because God is with you in good time does not mean God will not be with you in, trouble, in time of trouble. We need to be very careful in putting God in the box. We need to be very careful in setting a time frame for God to act. The Bible tells us that he makes all things beautiful in his own time. He did not say in our own time. In his own time. God is not a man. He lives beyond time. Many begin to feel a sense of abandonment by God when the time which they assume certain things will not happen in their life does not match the manifestation. And I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. So what is next after the storm? What is next? 
Yes, we may be going through what might be considered a drought, but what is very important is not to allow that situation to overwhelm you. It's to be careful not to languish in that state for too long. Just because you feel, not that you know, not that God has left, but you feel that God has left you, does not mean you should stop doing what you need to be doing as a child of God. It does not mean you should stop praying. It does not mean you should stop listening to the word of God. It does not mean you should stop reading the word of God. It does not mean you should stop evangelizing. Even the book of Proverbs 24 verse 16 says, For though the righteous fall seven times, what did the Bible say? They rise again. But what happens to the wicked? It says, but the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. Though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. What is that situation in your life this morning? Where you feel like God is not with you. The Bible is telling us this one to rise again. From all the characters that we have examined, we have seen that, you know, we have seen that they, that yes, they had a sense that God was distant at one point, but one thing that was common to all of them was that God showed up at his own time. God showed up at his own time. As Jesus cried out to God on the cross, God showed, him, God showed up for him in the grave, and he came back to life. Jake, Joseph, who thought he was forgotten in prison, was released, and even became the prime minister of a land, of a foreign land, not his own land. Imagine a Nigerian here put in jail, and they now make him a prime minister. And we know that here, once you are in jail, once you have a criminal record, you cannot attain a position, a political position. But Joseph became a prime minister. Elijah who had indicated that he was no better than his father, who wanted to just die. He went up to heaven in chariots of fire. And lastly, Job, who lost all things, received a double portion of all he had lost. So what do you do when you feel empty? What do you do when you feel empty? Number one, rely on God's truth and not your feelings. Your feelings will betray you. Your feelings will mislead you. So this is where you need to go back to who God is. Rely on God's truth. After David had lamented in verse 1 and 2 of Psalm 22, he shifted his focus on what he shifted his focus from what he was feeling to the truth about God. He shifted his focus from what he was feeling to the truth about God. Remember I said in verse 1 and 2, the Bible tells us in, um, in the book of um, Psalm 22, where David said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you far from me? From the words of my groaning, blah, blah, blah. But verse 3, what did, what did David say? He said, yet you are enthroned as holy one. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and delivered them. They cried out to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. He knew that this God that his fathers, his forefathers relied on, that they trusted in, and that he saved them, delivered, how much more is himself? He trusted on God's truth, that God is a deliverer. God is a deliverer. They will never forsake his own. His own. He reminded himself that God is holy, that God can be trusted, and God delivers his own people. Another thing we need to do is we need to continue to meditate upon God's word. Even as the Bible tells us, that, you know, it says, it says his word, that the word is near you. It says Deuteronomy 30 verse 14 and Romans 10 18 says, the word is near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart. So continue to meditate upon God's word. He will never leave me or forsake me. He will never leave me or forsake me. He will never leave me or forsake me. God is with us. God is there. God is there. God is there. Though God may seem distant, but he's always speaking through his word. We need to commit ourselves to reading from him. You may not hear audibly from him, but the word is speaking. So this is where you need to devote yourself to God's word. Read the word. Meditate upon the word. Chew the word until it becomes a part of you. So you can be sure that God will never leave you alone. He will show up for you and restore all that you seem to have lost. If only you would patiently wait on him and not leave your post. The Bible says, I will stand upon my watch and listen and hear what he will say to me. Are you standing upon your watch? As believers, let us take our stand and not be like the world that run to and fro seeking what is not lost. But rather, let us stand in our place and God will show up as he has promised. Some people, they feel they stand from God. What do they do? They now start going to do yoga. They now start going to do palm reading. They now start going to do some ridiculous things that God is knowing it. And even in doing those things, they now dig themselves deeper. 
that they will even get to the point of even no return. But I pray that such will not be our faith in the mighty name of Jesus. The book of Ecclesiastes 10 verse 4 says, If a ruler's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. If you feel that perhaps God is distant, if you feel like God is silent, do not leave your post. Do not stop being a Christian. Do not stop believing in God. Do not stop trusting in God. Rely on his word. Rely on his character. God is true. He has done it. He said, he said that my words, my word I sent for you, they will achieve, they will do that which I have sent it for to do. They will not return to me void. This is God. We know God. This is his character. We know the devil as a liar. The devil will promise you one thing and do another. Or another. That, that is his character. But we know God's character. He's faithful to do that which he has promised. That is his character. His character is faithful. His faithfulness. I pray that God will help us. Just quickly some Bible passages. Romans 10 verse 11 says, Anyone that trusts in him would never be put to shame. Anyone that trusts in him will never be put to shame. James 1 verse 2 to 3 says, Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. For the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And I pray that even as we are tested, that indeed our faith will produce perseverance in Jesus' name. That even if it did, if, if, if it is a sin that separates us from God, that the Lord in his mercy will forgive us in the name of Jesus. That if it is a test of our faith, that we will not fail God. That we will stand firm to the very end. And I pray that God himself will comfort each and every one of us. In Jesus' name. Amen.